Binge the full week of The Ray Taylor Show ad-free over at InspiredDisorder.com slash plus. This is The Ray Taylor Show. Welcome to Top 5 from The Ray Taylor Show, where each week I rank movies in a variety of categories, from franchise and subgenres to directors and actors. No film is left unwatched as I break down my top five picks. So join me every Sunday for new episodes and get ready to dive into the world of film with Top 5 from The Ray Taylor Show. Today, we're diving into the dreamy and evocative world of a true auteur. She's a whisper in the Hollywood hustle, hustle. A distinctive voice that echoes the complexities of youth and fame. Yes, folks, we're talking about the one and only Sofia Coppola. Coppola, a name synonymous with cinematic royalty, but today's star has made her own indelible mark on the silver screen. She not, she's not just the princess of the Coppola clan, she's its reigning queen of subtlety and style. With her debut feature of The Virgin Suicides, Coppola beckoned us into her ethereal vision, crafting an enigmatic tale that floats on the edge of reality. Just like those Lisbon sisters, we couldn't tear our eyes away from. But that was just the opening act. Fast forward to a Tokyo hotel where Bob and Charlotte taught us the art of finding connection in disconnection. Lost in Translation wasn't just a film, it was a mood, a vibe, an aesthetic that defined an era. And let's not forget, it won her an Oscar for Best Original Screenplay. Then, she served us history with a side of high fashion, redefining period drama with Marie Antoinette. Who knew the past could look so pastel? Coppola's Somewhere took us on a journey of introspection and celebrity ennui without leaving the Chateau Marmont. Stephen Dorff and Ellie Fanning showed us that sometimes the quietest moments shout the loudest. And who could resist the simmering southern gothic tension of the beguiled with every rustle of the petticoat and glare over the uh, candelabras? She reminded us that Desire and danger are often two sides of the same gilded coin. Sofia Coppola has crafted films that are unmistakably hers, leaving a fragrance of counterculture sophistication that lingers long after the credits roll. Her minimalist approach, her use of music to punctuate the silence, and her exploration of the inner lives of her characters, this is what cinema is all about. Now it's time to whisper our secrets and declare our top five Sofia Coppola films. With the opulent despair of Marie Antoinette takes the cake, will the opulent despair of Marie Antoinette take the cake, or will the melancholic melody of the Lost in trans- Translation play its way to the top spot? Get ready, because this episode, we're not just ranking movies, we're ranking masterpieces. So join me after the break uh, on a journey through Sophia's cinematic gardens begins. (laughs) So join me after the break where the journey through Sophia's cinematic garden begins. You don't want to miss this because today on Top 5, it's not about the crown. It's about the craft. Woo! So I... Try to make. I'm trying to make a point to watch more films and highlight more films dra- created by women. Also, want to start highlighting more actresses as well. Film, like many industries, very male-dominated industry. Uh, so many great directors are men, but there are plenty, many great female directors, and I've been looking for forward to this actually for a while wanting to revisit a lot of Sofia Coppola's films Uh, I've seen a lot of them when they first came out Uh, was a fan of hers in those early films and hadn't seen a lot of the movies that she's created over the years and wanted to do so Uh, and watch all of them I watched all of her movies in preparation for this in order of release and 
you know, it's it's a fun journey, a fun journey, a lot of great movies, and it's uh, it was a lot of fun to make this list, I got to say. Um, so with all that said, let's get started on my top five Sofia Coppola films. Starting off with a film that uh, surprisingly was probably the most independent, had the most independent film vibes to all of them. Despite the fact that this movie came out kind of in the middle of her career. Uh, but starting off with number five is a movie that I had never watched until uh, preparing for this list. And that movie coming at number five is Somewhere. This is Sofia Coppola's Somewhere is came out in 2010. Drama uh, that offers a quiet meditation on fame, human connection, and self-discovery. Uh, it's a great cast. Stephen Dorff, Ellie Fanning. Chris Pontius, among others. I love seeing Chris Pontius and stuff. The guy from Jackass. Uh, he was my favorite part of the that one water park movie, Action Park, I think it was called. Uh, Johnny Knoxville movie. But Chris Pontius in that movie is great. He's also great in this, very small part. But the the moments where it's him like playing Guitar Hero and coloring with Ellie Fanning were like their interactions felt very much unscripted i so much fun anytime i see chris Pontius and something uh i really enjoy it which is a kind of a crazy statement to say but anyway small cast very independent feel this film follows uh johnny marco who's played by steven dorth who is a newly famous actor who is living in the tabloid ready life uh living a tabloid ready ready life of excess in the chateau mormont in Hollywood, uh, his days are a haze of drugs, sex, and general aimlessness, uh, punctuated by press obligations for his latest action movie. Johnny's life begins to gain some semblance of structure when his 11-year-old daughter, Cleo, played by Ellie Fanning, comes to stay with him. Her unexpected visit forces Johnny to re-examine his life uh, of empty indulgence. Cleo's presence brings a sense of innocence and reality to his life, serving as a stark contrast to the superficiality of his Hollywood existence. The narrative is sparse and relies heavily on visual storytelling, following Johnny as he uh, following Johnny as he shuffles through his daily routine with and without Cleo. The slow-paced exploration of character and setting reflects Johnny's own introspection and journey towards finding some sort of purpose or direction. Coppola's direction focuses on moments rather than plot, creating a film that feels almost voyeuristic, as if the audience is glimpsing into the real-life moments of a person struggling with ennui. Steven Dorff gives a restrained and nuanced performance, allowing the audience to emphasize or empathize with Johnny despite his privileged position. Ellie Fanny shines as Cleo, bringing depth and a sense of warmth to the film. The film captures the surreal bubble of celebrity life, juxtaposing luxurious settings with the loneliness that often accompanies them. True to Coppola's style, the soundtrack and uh, use of music in Somewhere play a pivotal role in setting and tone, uh, and supporting the film's f mood. Sofia Coppola won the original, uh, won the Golden Lion at the Venice Film Festival sh for somewhere, which was seen as a return to her uh, personal style of filmmaking after the historical grandeur of Marie Antoinette, which that is definitely, to go from Marie Antoinette to this is, is uh, definitely a return to the basics. The film's reception was mixed, with some praising its subtlety and depth, while others found it too slow and lacking in plot. However, Somewhere remains a distinctive piece in Coppola's filmography, reflecting her unique voice and perspective on the themes of isolation and connection. I enjoyed this movie. Like, this is a thing, an aspect I enjoy watching movies in preparation for the show especially movies by a specific director. It really gets you into the vibe of the director. 
and lets you understand how they like to make movies. And Sofia Coppola likes subtlety, likes doesn't mind a slow paced uh, movie. There's not the plots are very loose, it, usually examining small ideas and emotions. Um, and I really like this movie. It was it, it was a, a pretty great like uh, like I don't know. It is it is like a hangout movie. You're hanging out with this guy, and you're seeing how just boring his life is, <laughs> having all this money, living in a hotel, and then when his daughter comes, his connection with his daughter kind of changes him a little bit and it's a, a fun father daughter type of a, a movie um and again chris pontius is great the scene with him and, and ellie fanning is like probably the highlight of uh, like the the most joy is comes from those moments uh it's great but anyway coming in number five my fifth favorite sofia coppola film is somewhere moving on to my fourth favorite Sofia Coppola film. This is one that I watched and uh previously I watched it when it was released and we, it was okay. But in this rewatch, after having watched so many of Sofia Coppola's movies building up to this one, uh I and knowing her style and knowing the way she likes to tell stories, the simplicity, the nuance in rewatching this, I really fell in love with this movie. Uh, I really did enjoy this movie. Uh, so coming in at number four is On the Rocks. This one came out pretty recently, 2020. This is a comedy slash drama written and directed by Sofia Coppola, uh, marking yet another entrant into her distinct, distinguished filmography that often explores themes of personal relationships and existential ennui. Uh, the cast of this is great as always. Has Bill Murray, Rashada Jones, or Rashida Jones, I'm sorry, and Marlon Wayans in lead roles. The film centers on Laura, played by Rashida Jones, a New York-based author and a mother who is facing a potential crisis in her marriage to Dean, who's played by Marlon Wayans. Laura begins to suspect that Dean may be having an affair after a series of events triggers her doubts, especially given his frequent travels and somewhat distant behavior. When Laura's character... Uh, uh, when Laura's charismatic and playboy father, Felix, played by Bill Murray, enters the scene, he encourages these suspicions and offers his help to investigate the matter. Felix is a larger-than-life figure who still enjoys his high-society lifestyle, and his relationship with Laura is filled with affection, but also underlined by the complexities of their past, particularly Felix's own infidelities and the effect they had on Laura's view of relationships. Together, father and daughter embark on a series of escapades across New York City to find out the truth about Dean leading to comedic situations, but also heartfelt conversations about love, trust, and general differences in viewing of relationships. Bill Murray delivers a charming and layered performance, bringing both humor and depth to the character of Felix. Rashida Jones offers a nuanced portrayal of Laura, evoking sympathy and strength. The film's heart lies in the chemistry between Laura and Felix and their dialogues and the sweet yet complex bond they share, which drives the narrative. Sofia Coppola's signature style is evident in this film's pacing, the atmospheric portrayal of New York, and the sophistication, uh, and the sophisticated but subtle exploration of the characters' inner lives. True to Coppola's work, On the Rocks features a compelling soundtrack and stylish cinematography that complements the urban setting and the film's overall mood. Critics appreciated On the Rocks for its wit and the performances of the lead. Although some felt it was, wasn't was as impactful as Coppola's earlier films, nonetheless it was seen as a light and engaging exploration of modern marriage and parental relationships. On the Rocks was distributed by A24 and Apple TV+, Plus, marking one of the early original films related uh, to the new streaming platform. Uh, it received positive reviews for its performances, especially Murray's, 
and for Coppola's direction as it continued her exploration of complex family dynamics and personal growth amidst life's uncertainties. Uh, I love this movie. It is so interesting. Like Bill Murray's character, every interaction they have, he's constantly... He's kind of like a Jordan Peterson type of a character, which I am not a fan of. But in that, I he tries to intellectualize his past or defend or excuse his past in trying to make it part of the scientific nature of man, of men. And in every scene, he is spouting studies or findings about male behavior, why men act the way they do, why they are attracted to certain types of women, and breaking them down. All the while, we find out in the end of this movie when we see the truth of what's actually happening between uh, Dean and uh, Rashida Jones' character. Like, that confirmation bias and how Felix is constantly trying to excuse his bad behavior in his past marriage with Rashida Jones' mom, character's mom, and how he assumes the same for her husband and is why he's constantly trying to, in an educated way, argue for men being unfaithful. And it's super interesting because Bill Murray's character is ultimately not a good guy. And he's ultimately trying to convince his daughter that her husband is cheating on him because he cheated on his wife and he just assumes all men are like him. He assumes that the way he acts is some sort of natural expression of being a man. When in reality, he's desperate to excuse his behavior by using intellect, which I think is something that people like Jordan Peterson do, right? They like to talk smart in order to try and argue their biases and try to justify their hatred of certain types of people. Um, and of course, Bill Murray in this, he's charming. I love Bill Murray. I, I love Rashida Jones. I, I Marlon Wayans. I love all these actors. It's, it's a great cast. Um, and even while watching it, I was on the side of, yeah, this guy, everything seems like, yeah, he's cheating on her. And, you know, you're kind of almost being gaslit by Bill Murray's character throughout this movie until we see the end, which that's, I enjoyed in this rewatch. I was like, oh, that's so good because it's just subtle, but also something that we see happen we see people trying to justify horrible behavior trying to trying to use intellect to excuse their horrible behavior which is you know anyway but i i think pretty timely so that's why coming in number four is on the rocks let's take a short break from this episode listeners let me paint a picture for you imagine owning a piece of art that not only is visually striking but also exclusive Dive deep into the world of The Many Faces, a series that's now available as high-quality, limited-edition prints. Each piece captures the essence of abstract and surreal beauty, making it a perfect conversation starter for your space. What makes these prints even more special? They're all hand-signed and numbered by the artist. Me! Adding that personal touch of authenticity. And the best part... You don't need to break the bank to own one. Starting at just $5 for a 4x6, the sizes and prices scale up, giving you options to suit your space and budget. Art collectors, enthusiasts, or anyone who loves unique pieces, this is your chance. 
elevate your walls, and own a piece of limited edition artistry. Head over to InspiredDisorder.com and secure your exclusive print today. Now let's get back to the show. Moving on to my third favorite Sofia Coppola film. This is one I had never seen until preparing for the show. Uh, this was surprisingly very fun, uh, based on a true story. I don't know how closely the events of this movie are related to true events, but nonetheless, it was fun, interesting, unique, uh, and uh, tonally kind of, I think, like tonally probably like the m more exciting of Sofia Coppola's movies in, in, in moments, because usually there's a subtlety and a, a calmness and a... Uh, uh, slowly paced kind of a thing in this one there's some th some thrilling excitement kind of things anyway coming in number three my third favorite Sofia Coppola film is the bling ring this is a satirical crime film directed by Sofia Coppola that was released in 2013 the film is based on actual events specifically a 2010 Vanity Fair article titled the S the suspects war uh Lau Boutins, probably a designer uh, name that I'm not familiar with, uh, that was written by Nancy Joe Sales, which tells the story of the Hollywood Hills burglar bunch. Uh, this has got a great cast, ensemble cast, including Emma Watson, Kate Chang, uh, Katie Chang, Israel Brassard, Claire Julian, uh, Tessa Formiga, and Leslie Mann. The film follows a group of fame-obsessed teenagers living in the Los Angeles area who use the internet to track celebrities' whereabouts in order to rob their homes. The main characters, Rebecca, played by Katie Chang, and Mark, played by Israel Brassard, uh, along with their group of friends, begin burglarizing the homes of celebrities, stealing cash, clothes, and jewelry. The story delves into their exploits as they hit the homes of several celebrities, including Paris Hilton, Orlando Bloom, and Rachel Bilson. Uh, as they become more audacious with their burglaries, they start to enjoy the thrill of breaking in and flaunting their stolen goods, all while gaining a form of uh, vicarious fame. However, their criminal activities eventually catch up to them leading to their arrest and the unraveling of their superficial and materialistic world. The film is a critique of the celebrity obsession in contemporary culture, particularly among young people, and the impact of social media on privacy and crime. The events portrayed in the film are closely based on the true story of the bling ring burglaries, adding an element of true crime fascination to the narrative. Coppola's direction is notable for its stylized visuals and a soundtrack that complements the film's themes of youthful excess and the pursuit of fame. Emma Watson's performance was particularly noted for her departure from her best-known role as Hermione in the Harry Potter series, playing a character deeply Im uh, immersed in the L.A. party scene and materialism. Some scenes were filmed in the actual homes of the victims, including Paris Hilton, who had a cameo in the film and allowed her home to be used for shooting. That's crazy. I didn't know that. Uh, <laughs> the reception of the bling ring was mixed, with some critics praising Coppola's exploration of youth culture and others feeling that the film lacked a depth in its analysis of the subject. However, it remains a fascinating look at a true story through the lens of Coppola's thematic interests in fame, youth, and moral uh, emptiness. Uh, kind of crazy that they actually filmed in uh, Paris Hilton's house. Uh, I wonder if she does have so many things with her image on it. Um, it is pretty obscene, although uh, I guess it wouldn't surprise me. <sighs> Just... I'm not a fan of I'm not a fan of that aspect of culture, the celebrity obsessed culture. Uh, so part of me was like, I don't know it. For one, if you're rich and you're not locking down your house, you're not having security on your house. Like, what are you doing? Like, th there's no way these kids should have been able to get into your house. Like, I've never left my home 
that open and I don't own anything. And so like for these kids to be able to get into these houses, like, well, I mean, these famous people should know better. They should have some security, whatever. Obviously some of them do there ends up leading to them being, getting caught. But I don't know. I, I really had a lot of fun with this movie. You know, it's, it's a fun, like rise and fall kind of a thing. The, the whole uh, Emma Watson and her family, very interesting. Uh, seeing how, like, she just tries to spin this, uh, this b- punishment into a, a career. Um, yeah, it's, it's very much like L.A. fame worship, uh, which, you know, it's fun to see all of those people get their comeuppance (laughs) the people that are obsessed with it on both ends uh but yeah i had a lot of fun with this movie i really enjoyed it uh that's why coming in number three is the bling ring moving on to my second favorite sofia coppola film of all time this was a rewatch but it has been a while i don't know if i've seen this movie since it hit theaters i have like hair that is attacking me all over I haven't watched this movie probably since it came out. I've actually I probably saw it a couple times after. I, I feel like I had this on DVD, but it's been a while since I've watched this movie. And I was this is one of a few movies that I was really excited to have a rewatch of from Sofia Coppola. And in this rewatch, I I enjoyed all of her films more in this rewatch. I I really love her style. I love her movies. And coming in at number two, my second favorite film from Sofia Coppola is Lost in Translate, in, <laughs> Lost in the ability to say Lost in Translation. Uh, this was a critically acclaimed film directed by Sofia Coppola, released in 2003. This film is often considered one of Coppola's best works, which obviously I agree, earning her an Academy Award for a Best Original Screenplay, which is interesting that she's won multiple best screenplay academy awards but not director i wonder how often that happens for auteurs to win screenplay but not director for a film Uh, this has a great cast as so many this returning or probably the first time she worked with bill murray as bob harris an aging american movie star who finds himself in tokyo for a whiskey commercial shoot you have scarlett johansson as Charlotte, a young, recently graduated woman from Yale, feeling neglected by her husband, who is a celebrity photographer on assignment in Tokyo. The film explores themes of loneliness and alienation and the fleeting nature of human connections. Uh, Set against the backdrop of a bustling and neon-lit Tokyo, Bob Harris going through a midlife crisis and facing an estranged relationship with his wife meets Charlotte, who is dealing with her own feelings of displacement and uncertainty about her future. Despite the significant age difference and their respective marital statuses, the two form a bond that deeply affect them both. They spend time together exploring Tokyo, experiencing both the quiet moments and the vibrant nightlife. Their friendship develops as they share intimate conversations about life and love, finding solace and understanding in each other's company. The film is characterized by its subtle emotional tone and moments of understated comedy, emphasizing the internal worlds of the characters rather than the overt plot developments. Bill Murray's and Scarlett Johansson's performances received widespread acclaim, Murray's nuanced portrayal of Bob Harris brought him an Oscar nomination for Best Actor. The film is nominated, f- was uh, was nominated f- or noted. The film is noted for its visual aesthetic, capturing the energy and culture of Tokyo, while also conveying the isolation felt by the characters. Coppola uses uh, Coppola's use of shots that linger on the characters in silent adds the mood of introspection. There's a dreamlike quality to the film, enhanced by the soundtrack and the depiction of the Tokyo setting, which feels almost otherworldly to the American protagonist. 
The film also touches on the idea of being a foreigner in a land with starkly different cultural norms, which adds to the character's sense of being lost and disconnected from their surroundings. The movie is lauded for its emotional depth, exploring the subtle dynamics of human connection without dramatic conf confrontations or resolutions. The ending in particular is notable for its ambiguity and emotional complexity. Lost in Translation is one is a subtle, contemplative film that resonates with audiences because of its focus on characters and mood, its sensitive portrayal of human connection, and its beautiful rendering of Tokyo as both a setting and a character in its own right. It remains a touchstone film in Coppola's career and a standout film in the early 2000s. Uh, this movie, yeah, the, just being somebody in a place that feels so foreign to you, so alien to you, a place where you don't relate to it at all and finding somebody else that is in the same position and can understand that feeling and the type of connection you can make with somebody that is so different from you but because you share this disconnected alien feeling you're brought together and you're able to you know at least share your experience share your time with this person it is such an e it's such an interesting movie and i think the part of the interesting aspect of it is the age difference because it just it it emphasizes how two very different people coming from two very different generations because they are both in a very similar situation of being alienated being so out of touch with what's going on while also both dealing with relationships that may not be working for them, how they could find that connection between each other. It is, it is like, it is such an interesting, like it's a romantic movie without the characters being romantically entangled. Like they never sleep together. They never kiss. I mean, maybe they kiss on the cheek or something like that. There is the scene at the end where he whispers something in her ear, right? After tracking her down, they have a very, very uneventful goodbye in the lobby, which is heartbreaking. But then when he's on his way to the airport, he sees her walking down the street and jumps out of the cab and runs afterwards so they can have a real goodbye, whispers something in her ear. It is just, it, it's, it's a beautiful film. It's it's so beautiful. It's great work of art, and a movie that I appreciated more. I don't know if it's because I'm older. I don't know if it's be probably that combined with the fact that I watched. I mean, I watched Sofia Coppola's movies in order of release. So this was the second film. I believe this was her second film that I watched. So I was in the mood. I kind of in the vibe of Sofia Coppola's movies already. Um, but yeah, it was a great rewatch. I really enjoyed watching Lost in Translation again. That is why it is here at number two. But it's not my favorite. Let's take a short break from this episode. Hey, loyal listeners of The Ray Taylor Show. You know it's one thing to tune in and engage with the content I passionately create for you. But what if I told you there's a way to wear your fandom? Introducing our exclusive line of merchandise inspired directly by the vibes and visuals of this very podcast. From stylish t-shirts that will make you stand out in a crowd to our eco-friendly biodegradable phone cases adorned with artwork inspired by the show. You can now carry a piece of the Ray Taylor show wherever you go. Whether you're looking to make a fashion statement, protect your phone with some flair, or simply want to show off your love for the show, our merchandise has got you covered. Ready to rock our gear? Head over to InspiredDisorder.com and get yours today. Wear the show, be the vibe. Now let's get back to the show. It's not my favorite. And I don't know how often this happens as we move on to my, my favorite. My favorite Sofia Coppola films. I don't know how often it happens where... A director is like 
so good right off the bat. Just like is able to make what I would consider to be a masterpiece in their first film. So that's why I'm really happy that coming in number one is The Virgin Suicides. Uh, this was her first film. This came out in 99. It's a drama written and directed by Sofia Coppola, which serves as her feature film debut. It's based on a 1993 novel of the same name by Jeffrey uh, Eugenides. The film is a poignant exploration of adolescence, family dynamics, and the mystique surrounding five enigmatic sisters. The cast in this movie is great. You have Kathleen Turner as Mrs. Libson, the strict and pious mother of the Lisbon sisters. You have James Woods as Mr. Libson, a math teacher and the uh, ineffectual father of the family. You have Kirsten Dunst, who is a frequent collaborator with uh, with Sofia Coppola. Kirsten Dunst as Lux Libson, the most rebellious and sexually curious of the Lips Lipspin sisters. You have Josh Hartnett in this as Trip Fontaine, the high school heartthrob who becomes infatuated with Lux. You have A.J. Cook, Hannah Hall, Leslie Heyman, and Chelsea Swain as the other Lisbon sisters who each have their own distinct personalities but share a common tragic fate. Spoilers alert, spoiler alert for the title of this movie. Uh, set in the 1970s in a quiet Michigan suburb, the film follows the lives of the five Lisbon sisters. The story is told from the perspective of an anonymous group of boys who are fascinated by the sisters and attempt to understand the mysterious uh, the mysteries behind their lives and their eventual deaths. The Lisbon family is a picture of mid-century conservative values, but beneath the surface there are signs of dysfunction and strict parental control, especially from their overprotective mother. After the youngest sister, uh, Cecilia, played by Hannah Hall, commits suicide, the Lisbon parents tighten their grip on the remaining girls, isolating them from the outside world. The sisters, who are seen as ethereal figures, become objects of intense curiosity and desire amongst the local boys. The, the boys' infatuation with the sisters becomes a mixture of voyeuristic fascination and heartfelt concern. The narrative unfolds as a series of memories and anecdotes collected by the boys who piece together the events leading up to the sisters' ultimate fate. Throughout the film, Coppola use of lyrical visual language and a haunting soundtrack to create a melancholic and atmospheric tale that reflects on the pain and confusion of the adolescent's life. Coppola's distinctive aesthetic is evident in this film with its dreamlike cinematography and a strong sense of time and place. The film delves into themes of repression, the mystification of female adolescence, and the failure of the adult world to understand or save the Lisbon sisters. The evocative score by French Electric, uh, the by French electronic band Air contributes to the film's ethereal and somber mood. The film received critical acclaim for its style and performances, particularly Dunce for port her portrayal of Lux, and it has garnered a cult following over the years. The Virgin Suicides established Sofia Coppola as a filmmaker with a unique voice and vision setting the stage for her future work that would continue to explore complex emotional narratives with depth and subtlety. This movie, uh, just it's so tragic, this movie. It is so tragic seeing the, the damage of conservative values, uh, how repression and, and just it's it's the 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 idea of if you love something let it go right as opposed to grabbing it tighter because in this movie when the mom in order to th think she's protecting her daughters is really squeezing them to death squeezing the life out of them 
And it's so sad. It is so tragic that for these girls, the only way they felt they could get out and get free is to commit suicide. And I had somebody ask me when I told them I was watching this movie, they wanted to ask me my thoughts on it afterwards. And they wanted to know if they should show it to their daughter or their kid. I don't know. I was And asking me if I felt it, it glorifies suicide. And I don't at all. I think this is such a tragic movie. I think it shows that, you know, people that commit suicide – in my opinion, the people that I know that have done it, the times that I have contemplated it, I've never attempted it. I'm the kind of person that there's not going to be an attempt. If it's going to happen, it's going to happen. But it's, you know, life is hard. And in those moments when life is hard, especially when you're a kid, you don't have perspective. You don't understand how big life is. That in those moments when you feel like that, and it's absolutely probably different for other people, but people that end up committing suicide, killing themselves, are escaping pain, right? Emotional pain, sometimes physical pain, sometimes just like the pressures of life. Like It is like an escape. And for p so many people, they feel like that's the only escape they have. It's the only option they have. They can never, they can't see how it could ever change for them. And sometimes it could be mental health issues, right? I mean, it's, sometimes it could be their perspective is altered because of a, a chemical imbalance in their in their brain. Could be trauma, but like, it's not like. I, I, I always part of the part of me obviously it's very sad when somebody commits suicide but part of me the silver lining in some ways is like at least they are no longer in pain I wish they had found a way to escape or alleviate their pain without that but they clearly couldn't clearly didn't and now they are no longer in pain and it's sad it's sad that for these girls in this in this movie that they had their life taken away from them they had no life they were living vicariously through catalogs and having to communicate through songs on over the phone like they had their their freedom taken away which they already had limited freedom to begin with and then after their sister died no freedom they were prisoners in their own home by parents that thought they were doing the right thing which is hilarious how often conservative parents think that massive restrictions and censorship and control is the right thing it is just such a misguided like path that they take and it's it's just this movie is just so tragic i think it's a great movie to show people to illustrate one of many reasons why somebody might want to end their life like these girls had no li they were not allowed to live anymore they couldn't go out like they they were prisoners in their own home and the warden was their mom and the dad was just you know he was barely there you know it's just tragic so i absolutely love this movie performances are great the the kind of fascination that the boys have with the girls like every aspect of it is great as far as like what it's like to be a boy at that age, girls at that age, dealing with trauma, all of that stuff. Uh, it, it's just it, definitely a tragic movie, but a great film, a great work of art, and amazing that this was Sofia Coppola's first film, directorial debut. So coming in number one, Virgin Suicides. And don't commit suicide. Don't do it. I know it's easy to say that. I don't know. 
you know, you obviously you can ask for help. Reach out. Um, but also know that life can change. Like these girls eventually would have gotten older and could have made their own lives. But when you're that age, like it feels like a lifetime before that's possible. But let me tell you, when you're 40, years fly by. Years fly by. So, you know, there's just because you don't think there's a way out doesn't mean there's not. And sometimes you just have to suffer. Like the uh, short film, The Swan, the Raw Doll short little story. It's about surviving trauma, surviving horrible things and being able to push through and push past it because i think that's possible you know i do think that's possible but at the same time you know i have to uh in my mind know that at least the people that do follow through with it are no longer in pain unless you believe in (laughs) the christian religion in which case they are punished for all all eternity which i think is just another aspect of how horrible uh so many religions are anyway number one virgin suicides honorable mentions uh the beguiled was a fun watch a good movie uh interesting uh marie antoinette another interesting movie just that none of them hit me and of course priscilla i haven't seen yet uh just got released in theaters not available on video on demand. Haven't gone to see it in the movie theater. So uh, looking forward to it, but I don't really care about Elvis and Priscilla. And I don't, I don't know. I'm sure it's good. I'm sure it's very interesting to see her story from, you know, basically seeing the, another aspect of how Elvis's life impacted the people close to him i'm sure it's a very interesting exploration of that character but i don't know uh i'll definitely watch it when it comes out when it's on video on demand and uh maybe i'll do a an addendum to this episode when it does come out but uh i loved sophia coppola's stuff there was nothing that i didn't like actively didn't like so uh, a fun watch nonetheless all these movies Uh, but let me recap my list and we will get out of here shall we it's a long one This is my top five Sofia Coppola movies ranked. Starting off with number five is Somewhere. Number four is On the Rocks. Number three is The Bling Ring. Number two is Lost in Translation. And my number one favorite Sofia Coppola film is The Virgin Suicides. Thank you for tuning in to Top 5 from The Ray Taylor Show. I hope you enjoyed my rankings and analysis on my top five picks or Sofia Coppola movies. Let me know how you would rank them. What what would you put at number one? Have you seen the newest film? Is it good? Do you think I would have it on my list? Uh, let me know in the comments. Um, please, I would love to hear it. Join the conversation by leaving a comment or rating on your favorite podcast platform or over on youtube.com slash inspired disorder where all these episodes are available in video format. Don't forget to tune in next Sunday for an all new episode. See you again next week for more top five. Subscribe to the Ray Taylor show on YouTube and everywhere podcasts are found. Binge the full week ad free over at inspireddisorder.com slash plus. Purchase Ray Taylor Show merch over at InspiredDisorder.com. Have a wonderful day, everybody. Peace out. Today Today is the the day day where you you wake wake up and you realize realize that everything that you've been dreaming about, everything that you've been wanting, every goal and wish and hope that you've ever had can become real. Dreams can come true. What you manifest in your mind, you can bring to reality.